Well, uh, one of the things I ended up doing during this uh, uh, right time uh, development, or the concepts of right time, was to take that original constant wellbore pressure solution, you Van Everding and Hurst, uh, that they really never published uh, QDTD values. They only published the cumulative uh, influx versus time because the application originally was strictly for water influx. You know, the material balance and equation straight line where they'd use uh, uh, or the water influx approach, and which was a series of constant wellbore pressures in a sense that they used to simulate influx. But they never really published the QDTDs themselves. I was able to get the, you know, the infinite acting values out of the groundwater hydrology uh, literature and the, you know, the depletion values uh, I got from Dr. Ramey uh, uh, Texas a uh, uh, when he was at Texas a and he got them out of the Russian literature and I just took those uh, and because of the work I w was originally doing on water influx I started to s uh, sort of understand the constant world war pressure solution and if you look in your notes there's an area here in the book where uh, I demonstrate how to convert Van Everding and Hurst water influx uh, coefficient uh, in dimensionless time uh, match points uh, when you're trying to get original gas in place to an aquifer productivity index and an aquifer uh, volume in place. Uh, and if you look in there you'll see that's how I really came up with the idea of making a conversion to convert yeah, the dimensionless rates uh, and the dimensionless times to this form. Which in essence did nothing but to take all those uh, stems that would go on uh, uh, forever to the right, you had different RERW stems. Uh, 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 well if uh, you define it in this term, you collapse all of those depletion stems into one. And also this turns out to be exponential. Uh, a couple things turn out of that. You know, if you look at this one, a Q sub i, this is the same identical Q sub i as uh, in ARP's equation, and this is Q sub i. That's the uh, pseudo steady state uh, flow equation. Yeah, but I don't have, or yeah, the skin appears in terms of RW prime, okay? Effective well bore radius if you, uh, 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 if you want to introduce skin. Uh, in dimensionless time, you divided by these two terms, and we collapsed all those into one, so that that what that ended up doing really was pushing all these different RERW stems out uh, uh, in early time. And what you have to be real careful of, because I didn't realize uh, that people were doing this, you know, they take some data and, and they say, gee, I fit right in here on RERW of 10, so therefore I've defined the in-place. You can't define the in-place uh, while your data is intransient. The transient data has to go down to one of the depletion stems to lock it in because in that conversion, this part, if the data matched here, it would match here and here and here and here because all that early transient uh, is common to every RERW stem uh, that falls to the right in time. So you, you have to kind of keep that in mind. But what I ended up doing really was uh, 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 developing so you can put on a single type curve uh, or the transient behavior along with the pseudo steady state or the depletion behavior. And if you take this definition uh, and combine it with ARP's uh, equation, you, uh, you end up with a total composite uh, rate time decline curve. It includes all of the ARPS uh, stems, which is the depletion or the pseudo steady state period, uh, uh, in the transient period, all on one type curve. And I'll show you later, but it's very easy to see, particularly if, if you go through the logic that you're going to plot data on log log of tracing paper and you're going to move around uh, uh, and find somewhere on a curve where you're going to match the data, and after you match it, 
you can evaluate parameters, but the other thing you can do is after you match it, you just extrapolate down your match point into the future, and there's your forecast. You slip the tracing paper back over the axes, and you read off the rate versus time directly off the tracing. No equations, no nothing. You, uh, you just read it directly. It's easy to see how an RERW uh, stem of 10 could very easily be placed out here with a a B value of about 0.3, and this is what was happening in the industry when people were doing regression analysis using ARPS equation. It required a value of B of about 3 to look like transient data. This was the period where they were starting to develop low permeability reservoirs, and you had to frack them to make them commercial. And there was lots of data in the transient period for years, 5, 10, maybe 15 years. I'll show you an example where it could exist as long as uh, 20 years. If it does, that's a classic example of a case for infill drilling. You know, if you're ever going to deplete the reservoir, you have to get on smaller spacing. And again, you can do that on on the uh, uh, type curve and extrapolate it. But. I mentioned earlier, you can clearly identify the difference between transient behavior uh, uh, and depletion behavior, looking at the type curve. We've got an example in here uh, uh, in your handout of, uh, of uh, one of the ARPS examples. that came out of his original paper. Uh, I, I, it's in my decline curve paper, but this is the way it looked uh, in tabular form. Uh, it was hyperbolic. Uh, uh, it ends up having a B value of 0.5. This is the uh, historical data, uh, the months, the years, uh, time. This was the forecast from his example into the future. And it turns out when you really read intensely the article that these rates uh, were not average rates. They were rates at, uh, in the month of January, July, January, July. So in setting up my time, like uh, uh, with this first rate, I plotted it at a uh, midpoint of the time period. I took his same example and said, uh, what would it look like uh, uh, if I went to Dwight's or PI's, uh, a commercial outfit that's going to give you, you the data in, in uh, a computer file, so you're going, you have to plot it log, log, and uh, if there was a constant rate period where it produced for about 100 months at a constant rate and then it went on decline, what would it look like if you didn't reinitialize the problem? So. Uh, I've added uh, 100 months to these times uh, to plot with his data. And then uh, another example is to demonstrate that I can restart the problem at any time, and if I know the B value, I'm going to get exactly the same answer no matter where I start. But this example is to kind of demonstrate to you that if I start here, I've cut off some of the earlier data, and I'm in a region on my uh, a type curve where they all coincide, and I can't tell a difference where you what B value uh, uh, it should go down. This is the plot of the ARPS data out of the original paper. Uh, it's hyperbolic on tracing. It's a beautiful fit uh, 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 of the data over the entire region. You move it around the match on the ARPS type curve, get a match point, and uh, the match automatically gives you a value of B. You know, it's 0.5. It won't fit anywhere else on the, the ARPS type curve. You get your match point, uh, the T and the TD and the QT and the QD, and you calculate D sub I uh, and Q sub I, and you get a B. You could put it into the equation and you can calculate into the future, okay? Another way 
uh, as you've mapped the data, just draw this line on into the future, extrapolate it clear into the future, slip the tracing paper back over the axes, and, and, uh, and then read the rate off the midpoint of the time period. Okay, it'll take you uh, about 15 minutes to get a production forecast. And you don't have to have a calculator. You know, uh, uh, if you forgot your calculator and got in a boondock somewhere and you're trying to make a forecast, this I'll, I'll on some performance data, that's how you do it. Yeah. It gets back to the idea you don't have to have an analytic solution in order to be able to use these concepts. I mentioned to you earlier, you had three fields with performance data, uh, and say you had one, and it was depleted, and you discovered the other one, and you had real early production data. All you had to do was plot it on uh, tracing paper, the same scale as your actual performance for the field, slip it over there, and match those points, draw it down, and you can read the rate time directly off the forecast, and that's your forecast. There's not a better method uh, to use for the method of analogy and an analogous reservoir than to use uh, with that particular technique. And it should be very accurate, very accurate. Because even if you're trying to do it on a model and you model the other reservoir, you got to match the performance of that first before you could uh, 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 we use it on the uh, you're the newly discovered one. Okay? Does everybody see that and how easy that is and how a powerful tool that can be using the method of analogy? That like the three fields that we overlaid, they're all different. Thicknesses are different. The spacing is different. The fluid properties can be different. Everything can be different. They're basically going to behave the same because they're in a common type reservoir, okay? Uh, it's a pretty good assumption to make. The other thing I mentioned, this is a full water drive field, the Arbuckle in Kansas. Uh, it's buglier, a buggy type uh, reservoir, uh, basically full water drive. It's got a B value of 0.5. Now, uh, this next example, like I mentioned, uh, a calendar time plot which uh, brings out the uh, most important point of all, you can't start decline analysis unless the well is on decline. Uh, and here all we're doing is adding the time when the well is uh, really not on decline, either build up or is producing a constant rate and we didn't reinitialize the problem. Uh, and if you take the same identical data by adding 100 months to all those times, that's uh, 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 what it's going to look like. Okay? I can guarantee you as you go over to the type curve and kind of move it around, the only place you're going to fit it is on exponential. And, uh, and you'll extrapolate. It just shows you that you have to initialize the data. The other example is uh, the reinitialization of the data using only the last five points. Uh, people used to use the argument that. Uh, Uh, the most recent data is the most accurate. That's that's what they used to do. So therefore, well, I'm just going to use the last five years. That'll give me a better answer. Uh, theoretically, if you know the B value, you're going to you get exactly the same answer no matter where you start. But if you take that data uh, using the last five years and plot it uh, on log log, and you try and go to to the ARPS uh, type curve, you're going to see it fits in a region where you can't distinguish between a B of zero and even a B of one. Okay? And you can get any one of these answers. And this gets back to if real data really exists in that time, uh, what should you do? Well, I hope that I've given you some of the guidelines about what the kind of B values you should select for your given reservoir driver, reservoir mechanism, or the slope of the back pressure curve for gas wells, and so on and so forth. That you have a basis for judiciously selecting a reasonable one. 
it to use to extrapolate into the future. When you go back and read the original ARPS paper, this is his example. Uh, uh, in his original paper of an exponential decline. And as you can see, it's in a region where you, uh, you really can't tell what it is. This is what you did uh, if you extrapolated the data down exponential versus hyperbolic. One case, the exponential, you'd have an economic, or if you extrapolate an economic limit of 20 barrels oil per month, you'd have a life of uh, 285 months. And if you'd extrapolate to the, or, or the harmonic, which is the limiting case, you'd get 1,480 months. You know, it's, the high B value is going to extrapolate to very large numbers uh, into the future, r real high recovery values. I'm going to tell you now, be very, very, very careful uh, about extrapolating, never extrapolate uh, a harmonic value B of one way into the future. When we get into layer reservoirs, we're going to try and uh, demonstrate to you it's the sum of two separate forecasts. When you add them together, you can approach a B of one. But ultimately, one will totally deplete, and then it's got the approach to B value of uh, the remaining one, you know, which by itself would be 0.4. Uh, in the red cave example, we were able to go practically 30 years, and we're uh, we're st uh, still on a B very close to 0.9. So, uh, you, uh, uh, but you have to be careful extrapolating uh, the real high values of B. You can use them uh, as kind of a diagnostic tool to indicate you're working with a layered no cost flow reservoir, and then you can trial and error. What uh, reservoir properties do I need for the two to get? You get to match the data I have, and then when you extrapolate those in the future, you're ultimately going to drop off of the harmonic or the, uh, the B1 into more a uh, uh, reasonable range. Uh, uh, on the type curves, you saw where I quit uh, at an RERW of 10, okay? That's because as you get to smaller and smaller RERWs, you start to pro you you, uh, you can no longer use the radial flow equation. You start going I I I in the linear flow. Well, in uh, 1975, Locke and Sawyer had published, after reading our uh, our decline curve paper, a constant well bore pressure solution for a well with a single vertical fracture. You know, because for oil wells, uh, frac lengths uh, are starting to get very large in some cases. I know Amico's report uh, reported for massive hydraulic fracks in gas wells in Wyoming up to well over a thousand feet uh, in half fracture length. You know, so you you start ending up where where the frac length is equal or exceeding yeah, the drainage radius that you're assuming for your calculation. Well, it turns out that an X to B of X sub F, where X sub F is uh, the half uh, frac length, uh, uh, 5 is exactly equal to an RERW of 10. You know, so this, this type curve starts to cover uh, uh, or the region where everything goes into linear flow. And I use this as a tool, too. This is an example of some data uh, published by Agarwal of uh, Amico on the results of a massive hydraulic frac job on a, a gas well uh, in Wyoming. And I, I'm going to try and demonstrate here to you, you don't need exotic special solutions to solve your engineering problem if you just use RW prime for a, a stimulated well. Just convert to an effective well bore radius and use the Van Everding and Hurst uh, constant well bore pressure solution. This is data that's fit on uh, uh, with the uh, infinite conductivity vertical fracture, a uh, constant pressure solution. The black circles here, uh, uh, and that's the match. And you can see at the end of about uh, 30 days, the rate uh, 625 MCF per day. 
uh, at the end of almost the year, uh, it's down to 192 MCF per day. All the data exactly fits on the analytic solution. You know, that's, uh, it's transient data. Uh, for one, that's a conclusion you can draw looking at this. There has been no fracture closure at all because all the data fits on the, the infinite act. If it were it, it, some type of fracture closure, it should have fallen off some way. Okay? Probably the most important thing to recognize, you know, uh, uh, I could draw different RERW uh, prime stems of three and two and one, uh, and they'd all lie to this side. And I could take this data and extrapolate down each of those stems, and on um, one sheet of paper, I would have a, a spacing study, okay? Because if you'd continue on this about 640 acre type spacing, it was originally being developed on, you wouldn't even start in the depletion for over 20 years. This is a classic example of an illustration of, uh, of the real application of infill drilling. Uh, uh, if you're going to deplete this in any reasonable period of time, it's got to be developed on uh, smaller spacing than uh, your 640 acres. And the other thing, like I said, I can extrapolate down the different RERW prime stems for 643, 20, 160, and even 80, all, uh, all on one graph paper, and give you the forecast to run the economics of is it economical to develop into smaller spacing. When you go through and you do the matching, you get a permeability of 0 0.0081 millidarcy. You know, that's low, low permeability. And they're getting good. Uh, skin to about minus seven. You know, this is uh, another concept, a horizontal well in a single layer system. Uh, the half rack length, uh, uh, if you take the total drill length and divide it by two, that would be equivalent to X sub F. You know, so uh, you'd have to drill uh, uh, a well, a uh, horizontal well of 16. A uh, hundred feet to get a minus seven skin, uh, providing there isn't any damage, you know, as a result of the drilling of the well, okay, and providing it's a single layer system. I, I again, you can make some good engineering calculations with regard to how much can I improve production with a horizontal well by just uh, basically using. Uh, and there's been a couple papers I uh, published on this fact uh, uh, by Ramey and some other uh, people. What you have to remember, though, uh, is you can't get the layer too thick because when you get thick, then you start running into partial penetration skin. Okay, and a partial penetration skin is going to add a positive skin uh, to the negative, so it's going to be less than that. Uh, it just to give you the idea that you can solve very complex problems uh, reasonably fast using the idea of effective well bore radius. Here's an example of some data. You know, the very first data I've ever seen where we were able to plot rate versus time for your decline analysis was here in the Ecofisk area on ETA. Uh, where we had the data on computer and we were able to plot the data uh, daily. And a lot of things came out of that. That's uh, in the field case history paper. Uh, some of the same points here. Uh, if you had plotted this data on a monthly basis uh, out of Dwight's, you know, uh, this is what the monthly data would look like. There isn't very much character to that, is there? The red dots? Uh, the engineer uh, prepared this plot, uh, Ken Tramco. He transferred in from El Dorado into Bartlesville, and, and he just finished a bunch of uh, stimulation jobs on the, uh, the Cotton Valley field down there uh, in East Texas. And we were trying to determine uh, their success and evaluate some parameters and so on and so forth. So when he got in and we got to visiting, he was able to call back to the field and get the charts, uh, or the gas charts, and that's where he got the daily production data. It wasn't measured by any special equipment or anything. 
He just got the meter charts and uh, he read off the rates versus time off of that. And this is a plot and you have a beautiful set of data when you plot it on a daily basis. These periods here are periods of shut-in. Uh, a two-day shut-in, three-day, four, and a 13-day. Look at that transient spike. Every time you introduce a transient in the well, you retrace the QDTD. But that's all this is, is a transient spike. This is some of the curtailment. You know, this this here is the inverse of this when uh, you first come on production. When you cut it back, the superposition says that it's going to go down and then it's going to creep back up again. You can see that in the data. You know, the theory fits. It works. You could take this data, uh, you, uh, you reinitialize it in time, uh, 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 and it ought to basically overlay that. Now, it's going to be shifted by a shift factor, but the whole point is you can use this data that you would normally throw away to confirm you know, the position of that the early time data, because that's what's going to, uh, you can get a match on that and you can get uh, a cage and skin. You can see all the way out here to uh, uh, you, uh, well over 300 days we haven't started down a depletion stem yet. Uh, I know that Carthage is on at least 160 acre spacing. See, this is plotting the data log log and look at all the conclusions that you can make from it. Okay? This is the way to look at problems in terms of if you can represent something in graphical form, this is real data and you plot the data in the same type of form, you can draw all kinds of conclusions about what's going on. This is a low pressure a gas well in Kansas and very low volume. I got to working on uh, this problem. The Oklahoma City office uh, was wondering whether they could uh, tie these wells into, or, or, or if they could build a gas, a gas gathering system into this area. It was uh, very close to the Oklahoma Kansas line. Uh, if they can justify it. Uh, the only data they had that they presented me was uh, the rate versus time and a build up and when you plot the rate versus time you can see that in the early time well about a half hour it went from 240 MCF per day within the three days it was down to 77 MCF per day. Again, one conclusion that was being drawn was uh, it was depletion. When you plot the data rate time it isn't depletion it was depletion, it would be going down one of these stems, okay? So it isn't depletion. Uh, another conclusion, well, uh, uh, we fracked the well and it's closing. You couldn't conclude that. It was a natural fracture system, they were closing. Another conclusion that you would normally draw, you know, because they were afraid that they might be wet and that's why they followed uh, the acid frack with CO2 so it unload wasn't enough volume to unload as it was liquid accumulation in the well bore. A, uh, a, a build up of water at the bottom of the well bore, a hydrostatic head that was going to, uh, the additional uh, back pressure of the accumulation was going to cause the rate to decline with time. Well, when you plot it and it fits the analytic solution, I can't even draw that conclusion. You know, so I can draw uh, four or five conclusions out of this data by plotting it on a log log and it fits the analytic solution it says it's acting perfectly normal there isn't anything wrong we just had a good successful uh, stimulation when you take the data uh, and match it you get a, uh, a permeability of about 1.35 from the rate time a skin about minus 3 a, uh, a build up that followed uh, on a horner you get a uh, 1.3 and a skin of minus 327. You know, this is where I always ask the question. You know, I've, I, I, I've analyzed the rate time data, I've analyzed the build up data. Which one's right? Which one's correct? I'd like to have somebody volunteer. Uh, you sort of, but which one is more right than the other? <laughs> Well, because it's the rate time courses while you're saying that, but which, 
uh, uh, which set of data will give me the rate versus time that I actually saw? Yeah, because the ultimate end, even if you take the pressure, the ultimate end of everything you're doing to, to gather that data is to make a production forecast. Now, if I use this data and go to my QDT, I'm all exactly match the data that I started with. You know, the, uh, that's my history match. And then I'm going to extrapolate it in the future. And here, the kind of as an example for, you know, I got a skin, I can get an RW prime, and I can assume a spacing. So I'll pick an RERW prime, and I'll take my data, and I'll come down that RERW prime. That's my forecast on a sheet of paper. I uh, never made uh, any calculations other than to get my skin, okay? That's how easy it is to get a production forecast from the data. And Mike, just a question. If you were to take that plot and flip it over, you must have been just near the Simulog, the start of the Simulog's very high in the orange. We'll show some classic examples where all you really do is to take your data and flip it over. Uh, 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 and if the flowing pressure was reasonably constant, the same data uh, 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 is going to fit on a constant well bore pressure solution if you normalize by pressure, a delta P divided by Q, okay? Uh, or Q divided by delta P. We're going to get into that. We have an example from a gas well in West Virginia where both the rate and the time were uh, continuously decreasing. And, and if you normalize, uh, the data has been rigorously made a constant rate or a constant well bore pressure. Uh, a presentation, and you analyze on either solution, get the same answer. Uh, uh, and then you can draw another more powerful conclusion from that, and, and that's that uh, if you'd used the last, I, I always get mixed up with regard to rate or pressure, uh, if I'd used, or I build up run after a constant well bore pressure drawdown must be rigorously analyzed using the elapsed rate and the elapsed time. Okay, that, that's a rule. That's a fact. Anybody involved in pressure transient analysis? You have to get the correct answer. You use the last rate, even though it may drop the factor of three. Use the last rate and the elapsed time. Yeah, what to get the correct answer, and, and you can see that uh, uh, from the type curve plot normalization. And uh, Raghavan, uh, he wrote a whole paper about that, uh, proving it. But these are two independent ways uh, of coming to the same answer, and one uh, just by recognizing the use normalization, a uh, trigger superposition, uh, and that's. Uh, behaves exactly like it had produced at a constant rate over the elapsed time if you do the normalization. This is an example plot out of the early, uh, the very first paper uh, on rate time analysis. Uh, you demonstrate, uh, you had an oil field in Oklahoma, just outside Oklahoma City that was uh, uh, very highly undersaturated. We had rate time data that, as you can see here, went down a depletion stem. A single phase liquid flow. Uh, at this time, we didn't realize that we could calculate the original oil in place. And this would be very rigorous because this is all above the bubble point. Uh, but you have to go down a depletion, or when you go down a depletion stem, you can calculate oil in place. Uh, you have to be in a transient period to get the KH and skin. So if you have data uh, in a transient end, uh, the depletion, you get KH, skin, and original oil in place. And we had some data here that we demonstrated uh, was fitting on this RERW prime of uh, 50. And we compared the uh, the KHs and skins we were getting uh, from the rate time analysis uh, with pressure buildup that existed on those wells, and we were getting uh, basically the same answer. Again, a lot of this is in these papers that are in this book.
uh, and, uh, I hope after hearing at least a verbal presentation, if you go back now and read some of these papers, you're going to be able to follow them a lot easier. Because I know if you pick them up cold and try to read them, they're very difficult to follow. This is when uh, I sort of developed the concept or idea, it dawned on me that uh, all the wells within a given field for, for a certain type of drive mechanism, if I was to plot them uh, on log-log paper, uh, that they all should overlay each other. Uh, and here we have uh, four wells, A, B, C, and D. Uh, they each have different symbols and uh, we plotted them on the tracing paper or mylar and kind of moved them around and you can see that there's a they all fit a single curve you know, which is what really theoretically should be expected once you start understanding the concept of a dimensionless solution and log log plotting uh, if well A fits the type curve and well B fits the type curve then I can throw away the type curve and well A ought to overlay well B. Okay? Does it follow? Well, we were able to use this concept when we were involved in trying to evaluate acreage offshore California. Well, we were able to use this concept when we were involved in trying to evaluate acreage offshore California. Uh, Dan Bradley uh, and Deanne Craig were in a Denver office and they put together a report on, on the production performance of Monterey Reservoirs offshore California. And they went out to California uh, what, to get the data and they send in a report and again this was during uh, the period I was doing a lot of this work so we took uh, There's a log log plot of uh, the rate time data. Now I'm going to sit down on this one so that I won't get in the way when we're. Now I have to keep remembering that we're videotaping this too. I already gave away the surprise because I had to lay it down. You know, there's the Orcott field. Uh, it's a separate field onshore California. Uh, 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 the Lompoc field, uh, uh, the West Cat Canyon field, and these are, uh, again, these are separate fields in the Monterey Reservoir. Uh, the Santa Maria Valley field, it's a big field, so we they actually had the production data out of two different portions of the Santa Maria field. You know, they're uh, a different portion of Santa Maria, and then finally, the Zaka field. And this is when it started to kind of an example fields in a uh, common type of formation. Even though the fluid properties are different, viscosities can be, you know, uh, one can be one centipoise, the other can be ten. You, uh, the thickness can be uh, ten feet, and the other could be a thousand it don't make any difference on a dimensionless solution. Those are just variables that change. The basic type curve will always look the same. And if the drive mechanism was reasonably the same, then all these fields ought to overlay each other if you plot a rate time data long, long. And it does. When you compare this, this very closely approaches a B value of about 1. They're very close to harmonic. And of course, what that says, I tried to show you here earlier, re emphasize it again. You see, we were starting with the t equals zero. Now, if you were to use the conventional approach, uh, 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 exponential versus a hyperbolic, big difference in your early production rate that you're going to forecast from the field. You know, that's what it's all about. That's. Yeah. What we ended up doing, uh, what little we knew at that time about the, uh, the Monterey field, 
it was intense. Everybody in the world knows it's intensely fractured. Okay. So he said, "Well, uh, uh, we'll run two thirty-two forties, just like we did for Elfis. That's you know that Echofis experience came back. We had an intensely fractured crestal area. Yeah, the outer regions of the Monterey would be less fractured because that's really hard rock. So, uh, uh, so we ran two thirty-two forties, splitting the volume fifty-fifty, and we had uh, productivity indexes of." Uh, about 10 to 1 for the intensely fractured versus less fractured. When you add two 3240s together, uh, uh, each B value by itself is 0.3, you get a B value of 1. Yeah, so, this uh, is also introducing the concept, uh, uh, the way we did it then, uh, you, you were saying this is regional, just like Elfisk. But after we got into the development, the drilling, the coring, the taking data, Helen Farrell looked at the uh, 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 fracturing. The fracturing was uh, very localized to small intervals. Okay. Now everybody treats it as a dual porosity uh, system, but in reality, you need a contrast in permeability to get uh, this type of behavior so it could be the fracturing is giving me the, the contrast that I, that I need and it's a layered no cross flow reservoir. Uh, the fracturing enters into the problem but it is not a dual porosity standard type approach uh, a, a fractured reservoir. Okay. But when you get into uh, doing each forecast uh, uh, separately I'll show you later a constant verbal pressure solution for a worn and root dual porosity system. You get a double depletion decline. I uh, uh, guess what you get for a layered no cross flow reservoir of contrasting permeabilities. No cross flow between layers. You get exactly a, a double depletion decline. You know, so the, the, uh, the natural fracturing could be the main cause of the layering to give you the contrast for layered no cross flow. Now, uh, it's due to fractoring, but it isn't necessarily a, you know, the easiest way to answer the question, and, and uh, there's going to be a problem there, because people are going to say that you can't get good RFTs uh, naturally fractured, is if you get differential depletion in layers, you have a layered no cross flow reservoir, period. Because if it's intensely fractured uh, through all the barriers, you know, it's in vertical communication, and you get RFTs, pressure is going to be exactly on the hydrostatic gradient of whatever the fluid gradient is. So it's easy to answer, the, but you can argue forever you know, about which one is it. All you got to do is take some data and you can prove it. A part of the problem though is how are you going to get these? Well, one good way to try and get these, and uh, I like to bring up some things because we were trying to get layer pressures uh, in Huguenin by using uh, Schlumberger and their, their production logging tools, okay? Uh, for one thing, they said, well, our uh, flow rates are kind of low. They modified and we were able to get that. Uh, what ends up happening, the wells were originally acid, or the wells were acid fracked, the ones that we were trying to get, uh, so you had communication behind the pipe. So if you had any backflow that was occurring, it was occurring outside the well bore where we were getting the measurement, you know, it was going on behind there. So that if you wanted to get that data, you had to do it before you did the, the big frack jobs to where you're going to frack, you're going to frack through near the well bore the uh, no cross flow barrier that you have in the shale, let's say. Yeah, so you got to kind of think this through. If you want that data, you're going to, you ought to get it early and you got to, what we ended up doing was specifically designing these small pinpoint type of acid treatments of each of the layers uh, so as not to try and frack through so that we could get uh, uh, layer pressures using packers. And, uh, and I'll show you later how we were able to get the you know, 300 pounds in uh, Harrington, about 110 pounds in the Crider, uh, and 120 pounds in the Winfield. Okay. Uh, so there are ways, really, uh, of getting the data to answer these questions because you, know, you can argue forever. I'm not a believer in dual porosity reservoirs. I just don't believe in them. 
I think there's other explanations for them. It's too exotic and too simplistic. It's both exotic and simplistic. And, and you can get data to prove it. You can argue, you know, because I know you got to argue with your partners because there's some that will come in with their exotic models, you know, we're using the latest technology. In all the reservoir engineering I've ever have done, there are no exotic uh, answers to problems. They're all simple. And if you understand the basics, you can ordinarily answer them all with very simple explanations. There's an example of this plot in, in the uh, vault law reservoir uh, a paper in there that uh, I don't know if this is in there or not. Uh, it might not be, but it's one where we tried to use the concept of a field type curve. So we took uh, about 30 different wells, really, and we went to a light table. We plotted the data on, uh, the data on mylar. Uh, and each of the wells is a different color. Have you ever tried to go to a light table with 30 wells and all the data is black circles? <laughs> yeah. You can't tell what's what. Uh, 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 so we used a little of our ingenuity and got it, the plots in color uh, uh, with different color codes. And that's what this is. And what we ended up doing was trying to fit all these wells on a single type curve. You know, the concept that every well in a uh, common reservoir ought to basically overlay each other. Well, what we ended up with was a bunch of data that looked out like out here it was transient. Uh, but one of the way of answering some of these questions, if you just did this and quit, uh, again, you can argue, yeah, we got a lot of transient data, we got a lot of depletion data. But one of the ways of uh, uh, settling some question is to get the match points and evaluate reservoir parameters. When we took this data and tried to match it and calculate uh, cage and skin, we got minus 10 skin. I don't believe in minus 10 skins. You, know, you just can't get there from here. They were normal type treatments. And it turns out that after doing it, it says, I know it don't fit there. You could take this data and you can reasonably fit it through here. Okay? When you do that, then you start getting reasonable numbers for all the well. This is another approach to it, is you don't look at one well by itself and say, oh, look what I got, and I got these answers. Is, uh, you answer, uh, or, or you, you analyze uh, several wells. Uh, in the vicinity, and they all better be giving you reasonably the same answers, because you're not going to go from 100 millidarcy to 1 millidarcy within one section, let's say, unless the geologist can tell you there is a a depositional environment that would really cause that. Okay, so when you do multiple uh, multiple well analysis, your answers should all become reasonable. The skin should be reasonably the same. The Ks should be not identical, obviously. You know, but reasonable. You don't have big variations of one or two orders of magnitude within a section. So uh, that's in essence what we did here. When you evaluate these for reservoir variables, they're impossible numbers. They're inconsistent. They don't fit there. They fit down here. And when you fit them here, and you start getting everything coming out uh, about the same order of magnitude of reasonable values. What this is here is a log log, a type curve, a constant mobile pressure solution for a dual process system. And here, this is for a given uh, lambda and omega. I forget which one it is. But uh, in the early portion here and in the late portion, you can't tell the difference between a homogeneous system. Uh, this paper came out almost exactly at the time we were looking at the Monterey Reservoir. And this region here scared the hell out of me, okay? That we were going to put this, these fields on production, and within a few days, we were going to drop off the end of the table. You know, this is the depletion of the natural factors, and this, this is the depletion of the matrix. That's, in essence, what this ends up to be, this type of double depletion decline. But when I got to trying to put reasonable, real reservoir variables, the only way I could see this is get down to one acre spacing. That's the only way I could get that ever to occur in the real world with reasonable uh, reservoir parameters. So, uh, well, it turns out the example they had in their uh, paper, they made a fundamental error that I'm going, 
uh, I should have already told you before that I haven't. It's a good time to mention to you. When you use effective wellbore radius in dimensionless time, as an example, you must use effective wellbore radius uh, in dimensionless radius, which is what this is. And they failed to do that. You know, so they ended up uh, with a synthetic example in their paper that appeared to follow this type of behavior, but it's because they didn't include the RW prime within uh, the dimensionless radius and the dimensionless time. And uh, once I found out that uh, uh, we weren't going to develop on one spacing, one acre spacing, unless I quit worrying about it, because when you put reasonable variables, they come out okay. But I'm I'm going to show you later. It's exactly the type of behavior you can get from a layered no cross flow system. That this would be a real contrast in the reservoir properties. Uh, uh, I'm initially going to talk about permeability as a contrast. That's easier to talk about. But the contrast you're really interested in is uh, uh, doesn't only involve permeability, it involves skin, and it involves volume. Uh, and you're dealing with ratios of, uh, of the potential of a layer over its uh, in place uh, divided by the potential of the other layer and its in place. And uh, if that ratio is vastly different, uh, if it's about 10, you're going to get the high B values of about 1. If it's 1,000 or so, you're going to get a double depletion decline, which is uh, saying nothing more. You totally deplete the more permeable layer, there ain't nothing left there, and then you start depleting uh, the less permeable layer in late time. And you exactly reproduce this type of double depletion with a layered no cross flow reservoir. The interesting thing is a lot of the characteristics of uh, dual porosity are the same identical characteristics of layered no cross flow. You know, this, uh, uh, you're telling you about the high B value, this rapid declining rate and then kind of a flattening out. What this is, is uh, this is production from the high perm layer. This is production from the low perm layer. That's all it is. It'll turn out, I'll show you again later, that uh, the pressure that you're going to see on a commingled shut-in is the pressure of the more permeable layer. You never see that as a low perm layer. So even on a P over Z plot, let's talk about gas because that's simple. Uh, the P over Z, might as well put it up, uh, uh, with the same problem. Now, I'm sort of introducing it to you now, so this identical problem of the high B value here, or the P over Z is going to look like that too. Okay? And what ends up happening, a lot of reservoir engineers say, well, I analyze the data. Uh, uh, let's say this data don't exist. I analyze the data, and I get this as a reserve, and I analyze the P over Z. I get, I've confirmed my number with two separate distinct approaches, and they're both wrong for the same reason. And this is where, if you ever retire and you got a little bit of money and you really understand this, you can make a fortune on this, you know, going out and finding these. And there are very simple rules where these are going to exist. Thick reservoirs are just invariably going to be layered no cross flow because the deposition can't be uniform. You know, the same permeability. You look at a thick reservoir and you look at the B value and it's going to be high every single time. And you're going to have the differential depletion and a way that you're going to be able to take advantage of it is to stimulate the low perm layers and you're going to get a lot of reserves that nobody even knew was there because you, uh, nobody ever recorded the pressure. Like in Oklahoma, Huguenin has been produced in 45 years. The original pressure was 425 pounds. The Harrington layer is 310 pounds now. The Equator layer is 110. But nobody knows that. Nobody ever knew that until we got into the hearings in Kansas and people started going out and taking data. And lo and behold, uh, over 200 pound difference after producing the field for 45 years. You know, that's a long time. And if you use a factor for uh, cross flow as low as 0 0.005, you have complete cross flow. Uh, the layer pressures would be equal, running it in the model.
you know, so that sucker's got to be tight. There is no cross flow. And I'm, I, a matter of semantics, uh, people talk about cross flow in the wellbore. Uh, I like to refer to that as backflow, wellbore backflow, because the way you have, using their terminology, cross flow in a reservoir or in a wellbore is to have no cross flow in a reservoir. Okay, so it's, when they say uh, uh, you've got uh, a cross flow, uh, uh, what they really mean is I don't have cross flow. The expression for cross flow applies to flow between layers in the inner well uh, region of the reservoir. You know, that ought to, you ought to make that clear uh, uh, when you talk about this subject. Uh, it's better to refer to it as backflow. Again, that's another indicator. If you have backflow during your production law, you have differential depletion. Okay? If you have a thief zone, uh, uh, people like to refer to, do uh, uh, you know what the thief zone is? That's the zone that paid your way in the first place. That's the one that made all the money. That was the high perm layer. You know, that's why it's low now. You shut it in. Look at the difference, too, if you're getting involved, say, in water flooding or something. Or the concept. If the high perm layer is on the bottom, uh, and I shut it in, uh, and the low perm layer is on top, and it produces some water, what happens every time I shut the well in? I'm injecting water back into the, the high perm layer. You know, this could lead to some damage, okay? Reservoir damage, as opposed to the other way around, where the high perm layer. You know, once you start to understand some of these principles, you can see, you can actually see in some wells by looking at data, it seems like every time they shut it in, it's damaged. Well, it, it, uh, if you have a high pressure layer in a well bore, do you have any water in a well bore, and the low pressure one is on the bottom, you're going to inject water way back into the formation. Okay, you're going to inject it. Uh, for a long time, never realized why uh, when we were in a, pan, uh, uh, a panhandle, we'd go out anywhere, West Panhandle, Texas, Houston, Oklahoma, Houston, we'd go out on a wireline truck. We'd look uh, for wet wells because we were going to put in uh, a tubing to unload the water, hopefully, uh, either as a, a, a tubing string to produce it or, or a siphon string to unload it uh, uh, and blow it there. We'd find wells that indicated they were wet because the charts were painting. You know, you had the liquid column kind of rising and falling, but you never had enough velocity to lift it. And we'd run in with a wire line and a float. Uh, you shut the well in, and within uh, 10 or 15 minutes, the water disappeared. You know, at the very beginning, we'd hit it, and, and uh, you'd have several hundred feet, and all of a sudden, within a very short uh, period of time, it was all displaced out of the well bore. Only now do we understand what was happening. Uh, the Harrington is the low perm layer throughout the uh, entire the Kansas, Oklahoma, the Texas, Houston, uh, in West Panhandle, and, and uh, it's got the high pressure. You shut the well in, and you're injecting gas on the top that uh, inject the fluid out of the well bore in, uh, into the more permeable layer. It all makes sense now. It didn't then, and. Uh, I've got an example that I'm going to pass out later where I did a reconditioning study on a well in the West Panhandle. Every time we shut it in, uh, we destroyed the well. It went like from a million a day to uh, about 10 MCF per day. And the shut-in pressure went from 40 or 50 pounds to 150 pounds. What we didn't realize was happening is the high perm layer was on the bottom, and it was open hole completion, and there was cavings in the well bore, and we shut it in. We displaced the mud, you know, that accumulated in the well bore from producing a long time, uh, back into the high perm layer. And what we were getting, at one time we were getting the pressure of the low, or, or uh, the high perm layer, and the rate of the high perm layer. Uh, when we mudded it off, we were getting the pressure of the low perm layer, and the rate from the low perm layer. So we really had the cues of each layer and the shutting pressures of each layer and a differential depletion. And then this leads to the next concept. Is there some type of polymer we could use in wells where we want to get this data, you know, to put in a well bore because we had fracked it. We might have the communication uh, uh, to where you can put it in there to seal off to one layer to get 
the properties of the other. It's just a concept. We were wondering whether we could have done that while we were collecting the data out there in a panhandle. I don't know if you can do the same thing here in some instances or, or not, but it just shows you how these concepts start to build on themselves and then you start recognizing what to look for and when you look at them, when you look for them you'll see them and when you go back and read old papers suddenly a whole bunch of things start making sense. And what you begin to conclude, and uh, what I've you virtually concluded is the majority of the reservoirs are layered no cross slope, particularly carbonates. You know, they're blank positions over miles and miles and miles. I, I, and you have the cycles where you get the seals in between. And when you take the data, you'll see it. Uh, and a lot of the original wells were completed open hole. And, and if they were stimulated, they were commingle stimulated. So they got lots of potential. You know, one of the the fields in this area that's got a relatively high B value and all the characteristics you have a layered no cross flow is that. I'll show you an example, or I'll give you a, a copy of a paper where they shut in the field, the gas field, for about four years, and they ended up with a shut-in pressure almost equal to the shut-in pressure of the field when it was producing at, uh, at the end of the first year. It went back up. Why? Because you're recharging for that that period of time. And I, and I know that data exists on ETA, to where we have the pressure versus cum, and then we had an extended shut-in. Uh, and the pressure after seven or eight years uh, uh, was as high as it was after the first year of production. And it all makes sense. And the B value is at least 0.5 or 0.6. It ought to be 0.2 or 3. You know, if you look at Ecofisk, the basic B values in Ecofisk are uh, a 0.3. Uh, but remember, we're dealing with the uh, uh, ratios of layers and uh, the contrast, not only in permeability skin, but also volume. So you have to look at it. And the only thing I conclude from the echo fisk on the combing of wells is there's not enough contrast to make that much difference. It, this is one of the early sets of data that we got. I think it was, okay, 1974. I think I published the papers in 73. This is data that we got out of uh, our reef reservoir in the Middle East, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. It acidized the well, and they reported the production data in on Telex. And you can see at the end of about seven hours, they're producing uh, 2,361 barrels of oil per day. And at the end of seven days, it was down to 1,000. And the, the classic interpretation again, it's depletion, it's a natural fracture system. We're only depleting the fractures. There, there's no storage in the uh, in the matrix. Or the fact that it was an acid job, that uh, and there were no problems, uh, the acid fracture was closing. Uh, and if you really go back and look at this well at the beginning, because they were getting this decline, they hit it three different times with three separate acid jobs. They were going to go out and frack in the new pay. We're getting the same answer every time. You know, you, you can't do much better than a minus uh, a, a five plus skin. You know, a, a, a five point two. When you analyze that data, it exactly fits. There's only one place you can fit it. That's on the infinite acting. Uh, I, I, when you analyze it for cage and skin, we get the same answer as what we got from the you know, build-up test. On this well, it was a true, honest to goodness, the constant well bore pressure case because the flowing uh, it was very highly undersaturated, and the flowing pressure didn't vary uh, only two pounds during that entire seven day test, you know, between 53 and 55 uh, psi. You know, and then you start looking, hey, that's 51 millidarcies, but you, you got to look at the viscosity too. You know, in, uh, in an echo fisk, you divide that. But ecofisk viscosity uh, about 0.35 maybe, uh, 0.33. Okay, so you multiply that, or, or you, uh, you divide the 51 by 10 roughly, 
And, and that's equivalent to uh, about a five millidarcy in the in the echo fisk area. The closer to home, the Eta, a uh, thin X well. I was over here at the time uh, the results came in on this. I uh, bought some ZR, I was here. And I sat down with him because he knew that I was working on uh, uh, rate time data and we plotted uh, well the rate time on this and you can see at the end of an hour it was 9,500 barrels of oil per day. Uh, at 10 hours, which isn't very long, you know, nine hours later we were down to 4,600 barrels of oil per day. No question about uh, Again, the conclusions were very much the same. Uh, uh, it was depletion. That's why the rates were dropping so fast, or, or it was a uh, 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 fracture closure, or we didn't have propens. But all the data exactly fits the analytics. It's very unique. You can't fit it anywhere else. You get a skin of minus five permeability of uh, about one mil Darcy. It's the expected behavior of a low permeability successfully stimulated well. It, you know, if this were depletion, it would be going down a depletion step. You know, so you plot it log log, you can answer the question instantly. Uh, uh, and you have to remember, you know, at the time all this work was being done, I was really the only one doing it. There were a few uh, uh, cohorts that were kind of working with me on it. and uh, It was frustrating at times to uh, try and convince people what we were telling them was true. Yeah, because once management gets something in their head, it's fixed in concrete. We all know that. <laughs> you know, it was depletion. It was scary. One of the reasons uh, uh, Cullender invented the isochronal uh, method of testing gas wells, uh, it turns out, in, uh, when you read his paper, he was saying the shifting of the back pressure curve, or the rate with time, really, we'll show an example here later, was due to low permeability. It turns out it isn't due to low permeability. It's due to low permeability successfully stimulated well. That, that RW prime in a denominator of dimensionless time is what throws you over on a part of the QDTD that's dropping off the end of the table. Okay, So you'll see it every time. and It, it looks bad in a tabulated form on paper. Okay, but When you plot it log log you saw you can immediately answer the question that was not depletion. That's we just are dealing with a low permeability reservoir there, and it was successfully stimulated. You can't do any better than the minus five something. Okay. When you take the Horner analysis on this identical test uh, or the QDTD, you basically get the same. Uh, like I said before, you know there are people who would say. Boy, you got a big error. The big difference between these, I don't understand. You know, a minus four eight, minus five. To me, they're the same answer. Uh, the permeability is the same. It's one millidarc. It's not ten. It isn't a hundred. If it were a hundred, I'd start looking for something like maybe the depletion of the natural fractures. Okay. You know, so the level of permeability tells me something. Uh, but I don't have to have it to three decimal places. Now, uh, uh, with me, ordinarily, one's good enough. You've got to learn to separate the wheat from the chaff, because you can spend a lot of time studying a, a portion of the problem that has absolutely no bearing at all on the final results. And, and, and that's one of the things you, you hopefully pick up from uh, learning to understand some of these very simple concepts. I mentioned to you earlier, you know, this is a kind of a figure that's in, uh, I think, the case history paper. Uh, again, a lot of these figures are out of these papers, but there's a lot of papers there, and uh, they're very long, and I think, again, if you were to go back now and read them for, because you might be interested uh, in a certain thing uh, during this discussion, you go back get a little more detail, and there's a lot more detail there, but this isn't 
illustration that when you're doing log log and you know you're moving over, if uh, if you're a transpose R E R W uh, stem of ten over to here, you know, it looks very close to B uh, a B value three by just extending the arc equation and plug in a number of three. There's a big argument for a long time that yeah you can get the values of B in excess of one because I got data to prove it. Of course they were looking at transient data, and that was the problem. They were using a pseudo steady state equation. They didn't realize. The meaning of the Arps equation is only depletion. That everything that ever been, all the data that ever been used to verify it in the first place was back in the old days when you were dealing with uh, uh, hundreds of millidarcy's reservoirs. You know they hadn't invented stimulation. The low perm layers uh, didn't ever show up, or you counted them as non-pay, or they never completed in them. If this is an example. See, but if I fit the data on this RERW stem of 10, and I, I'm going to extrapolate to get my forecast. I'm going to come down here, and it's a gas well, so I'm going to come down a B value of 0.4, and I draw that, and that is my forecast. Okay, I can add up the rates, and I get uh, the cum, and there's there's my reserves if I want to do it that way. But if I fit that same data here, look what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to go out forever and ever and ever, and I'm going to end up really recovering. Uh, when I add up the, uh, the production and get my cumes, I can end up with numbers ten times the original gas in place. Uh, again, the argument you always got is, well, it don't make any difference. I'll learn in economics and discount factors to take care of it. Well, as a result, nobody really understood what was going on. And you may say, why should you care? Well. Uh, uh, if we wanted to buy somebody's properties, we're trying to consolidate acreage. And if they were doing this type of analysis and using a BF3 and we were using transient, we couldn't even get in the ballpark to agree on a price. You know, they're going to put three times the value on it than uh, what we would, so we could never agree. You know, so there was a reason, really, to pursue it.